Welcome back to another episode of the I Hate It Here podcast. I'm so pumped to have Hannah here today. One, I feel like a little bit of a fangirl because I had been watching her videos for so long, and she'll tell you a little bit about those in a second. So Hannah, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Heba. I, I, I know about your podcast. When you messaged me, I was fangirling, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm so pumped. When I first started seeing your videos on TikTok, I was like, wait a minute, this is genius. Like, I love this. So right. how did... How did you come up with this idea? Like the f- mm-hmm. salary transfer? Oh, sorry, you tell the story. I don't need to tell. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, unfortunately, it's I call it my series of unfortunate fortune and events because everything ended up working out really great for me. But at the time, it felt really crappy. I was like at a low. Um, I found out I was underpaid. Long story short, I used to be a uh, senior data analyst supporting government contracts out here in Washington, D.C., Um, That was my prior career before becoming a content creator. And at one of my roles, I found out that I was making about $20,000 to $25,000 less than other people doing the exact same thing um, in my market. And that was like a really eye-opening experience. You know, I was still am still really young. I'm only 27. And at the time when that happened, I think I was like 23 or 24. So it was like, really hard to start your career kind of, you know, learning this lesson. And um, once I found out I was underpaid, I decided, you know, I'm going to go find another job because when I asked for a raise at my current job, they denied me. They told me I just started the role. So they were like, you have to be here a year before you even qualify for a raise. And even if you did get a raise, we didn't they didn't give out raises of more than three to five percent at any one time. So I was like, okay, I'm like stuck here. You know, I can either just keep going and keep chasing my market rate, never actually making what I'm worth, or I can go look for another job, right? So I started looking for another job. And in my first call with a recruiter, I had come prepared with my market rate. You know, I knew that I was worth between $100,000 to $120,000. I gave myself that range. And I was prepared to ask for $105,000. You know, I was like, okay, in this first call, I'm going to figure out how much they're offering. I'm going to say what I'm worth, you know, and I'm going to make sure I'm paid fairly. And when the recruiter at the end of the call asked me, what are your salary requirements? I just had this like light bulb moment. And I was like, you, I have nothing to lose. You know, I I was kind of like down on myself. I was like, I've got so many calls after this. You know, this is not the last interview. Let me just take a risk and ask her what the budget is for the role. And I give her so much credit because I thought that that was like a really crazy, risky thing to ask. But the recruiter didn't hesitate like a second. She was like, yeah, the budget's 115K. And I was like, that sounds perfect. You know, I didn't skip a beat. I was like, that's awesome. That's right in line with my market rate. But what she didn't know is that I was going to ask for the 105. And if she hadn't given me this transparency, that was within my market rate. You know, 115 was still within that 100 to 120K range I gave myself. But she had helped me make $10,000 more that I did not know was available on the table. You know, like I would have I would have cut myself out of 10K and they wouldn't have told me that they saved money. So that experience was just really eye opening, you know, finding out I was underpaid and then realizing how much transparency applies to that concept I, I, you know, funny enough, they sent me a job offer. I accepted. So I, I was working that role until I quit my job to start Salary Transparent Street. But I started it because even though I'm one of the few that was able to rectify the situation, you know, and get paid my market rate, I just couldn't shake that everybody else was still in the same boat, that the system hadn't changed, that secrecy is still normalized, that people are still dealing with this BS day in and day out. And I just had this idea, you know, I started making personal TikToks on my own account, sharing how much I made. And people were like, this is so helpful. Thank you so much. And I'm like, isn't it? Like, (laughs) this is such helpful information. Why are more people talking about it? And I just kept asking myself, you know, how do I get people to see that this is important? How do we normalize this? And I just had this idea, you know, let me just go ask people on the street. Because if I can make a video that helps people by asking strangers what they do and how much they make, maybe I can have an impact. And I asked my my fiance, my husband at the now, but my fiance at the time, I was like, hey, like, can you come out and like film me <laughs> doing this? Like, I know it sounds crazy. And, you know, we're not, we were not content creators before this. So he yeah. thought I was losing my marbles. He's <laughs> like, are you having a crisis? <laughs> and I was like, no, like, I think this is going to be fun. Let's do it. Let's just try it. Let's be young and fun. 
And we filmed our first video on April 16, 2022 in Georgetown, Mm -hmm. shared it that night. When we woke up, it was viral. Like it was mega viral. And for the next three months, every video that we posted on that channel, like which was zero, you know, we started from nothing. It, It was a zero followers, zero videos, TikTok account. Within like a week, it had over 200,000 followers, you know, and millions of views. And I mean, I'm not a genius or anything, but if you can't turn a business out of that, you know, with that kind of feedback and impact, then you're not doing it right. And so I just saw an opportunity to not only have impact and change our society for the better, but to also, you know, have freedom to be my own boss and start my own business. And I quit my job three weeks after that, three weeks after the first video. My husband followed me a month later, and we've been doing this almost two years now. I love that. And you also posted, and I saw your post on LinkedIn, you were like, I talk so much about salary transparency. I'm going to tell you how much salary transparency straight made this year. And you basically outlined everything. And I was like, holy shit. She just told (laughs) everybody everything. Well, content creation, like I kind of, I left an area that had a lack of transparency Mm -hmm. and I went into another industry that was almost even worse. Like the, the lack of transparency and finances for content creators is abysmal. Like, and you know, what's so funny is I made that post about how much we made and I shared how much our market rate is for a video. And I had tons of content creators message me and be like, you're undercharging. You need to double your rates. So me being transparent and feeling like I was like helping people, people were like, you're, you're still undercharging. You need to raise your rate. So it helped me even more. Wow. I love that people messaged you and said, you're undercharging. That is just like yeah. the goodwill in the world. But also mm-hmm. what you're doing is so impactful because on the employer side, so we're facing all these like pay transparency laws. And I, for one, am like very excited. It was my first newsletter send when they were like, mm-hmm. what is the one new, what, your first newsletter, what do you want to write about? And I said pay transparency because mm-hmm. I know how important it is. I too have been underpaid. I have been in HR and seen the salaries of my counterparts and been like, I'm underpaid compared to my counterparts. Yeah. So, How does that even work? So Mm -hmm. I love that you started this and did this because it's so important to me as an HR person because I'm excited. Like I'm excited that more people are getting more knowledge because then I also can come to the table and have like a really good conversation with them about how much the role is banded for. And when I start having combos with people and sometimes the salary is like higher, I actually go back to my data sources and I look at them and I'm like, did I benchmark this role incorrectly? If like all these sure. candidates are asking for something higher, maybe I'm doing something wrong too. And so the feedback yeah. loop is just insane. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's a there's a lot that needs to be done. There's still like a lot of systems and structures yeah. and strategies that need to be implemented. But, you know, it's kind of cool that we're sort of at the uh, what is it? The revolutionary period of this yep. concept. And we're just kind of figuring it out as we go. We're seeing what laws work, what don't. And. I I just am really excited to be a part of this movement and seeing people, you know, overcome their barriers towards like transparency. When you've walked up to people and interviewed them, have you had people been like, absolutely not? I will not tell you how much money I make. (laughs) You know, I feel like people in the comments act like they're so hard because there's there's so many times that people say, if this girl asked me, I would tell her to go, you know, stick it where the sun don't shine and yada, yada. I've never had anybody be really, really like horrifically rude oh, wow. to me. Like, I mean, in New York all the time, but they don't that's even know York. what I'm asking them about. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know, that's just normal. <laughs> that's just normal. Um, but like, I've had a couple older people ask me, you know, like, oh, well, that's a very personal question. Mm-hmm. What do you want next? My social security number? And, I, you know, I always kind of like laugh at them because I'm like, No, but I mean, if you don't get it, you don't get it. You're retired. You probably are not my target audience anyway. Like, it doesn't bother me. I think that if you don't understand the value of transparency at this point in time, I it's not my responsibility to teach you. Like every single person that I've interviewed, almost every single one has an experience about Mm -hmm. transparency and being underpaid, whether it's them or a colleague or a friend or family. And I just think that that is through and through the reason why people are embracing it, because we've seen the effects of secrecy and how it harms all of us. Like, Mm -hmm. to me, pay transparency legislation shouldn't even be a red or blue matter. It helps all workers. 
Secrecy only benefits our employers who get away with underpaying us. If we are all transparent, we all earn more. It's a very simple concept. And so when people on the street see me, they either have no idea who I am and they get (laughs) excited about the topic or they see me and they're like, yes, that girl is doing it. I want to share because I know this is important. Yeah. It's so wild, too. I was talking to someone about how um, you can buy uh, data, market data on pay, but the Mm -hmm. market data, it's so expensive, one. So if like you're an HR team with like, you don't have budget, you're not going to get access to it. Mm -hmm. And then two, it's only updated potentially every six months is like the quickest it can be updated to every year. It's always out of date. So it's always out of date. And so we're using these like out of date, really expensive tools that we sometimes don't have access to to make really important decisions about people's like livelihood. Right. Mm-hmm. Like your pay can determine at this rate, inflation so high, like eggs are so expensive. Your pay can determine you just being able to like afford to live in yeah. this world. And mm-hmm. so when we take it lightly, which I don't think a lot of HR people do, I just think we end up in the position where we're giving people under market rates and we don't even know sometimes that we're doing it. So yeah. I, I love that people are sharing it with you because there's so much power. Like we're, I feel like we're taught at work, like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You're not talking about those, but it's like <laughs> sex, drugs, rock and roll, and your pay. And your pay. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't talk pay. about your pay. Sign this like, NDA. You know, yeah. don't, you'll be fired. Like it's, oh my gosh, it's so, it's so taboo. It's so over the top. And to me, I just, whenever people tell me or send me messages, like my company had me sign an NDA and they're telling me I can't, yada, yada. I always tell them, you know, unless you're unless you're not protected under the under the National Labor Relations Act, it is your legal right Mm -hmm. to talk Mm -hmm. about your pay. NDAs are not enforceable and it should be illegal for companies to even have those documents and to intimidate their employers like or employees. I just hate this power imbalance between, Mm -hmm. you know, managers and corporate America and their employees. It's just not right how they take advantage of people who, you know, especially that's That's where I feel like the power imbalance shows up is in job interviews Mm -hmm. where you have a mother returning to the workforce after two years taking care of her newborn or someone, you know, fresh out of school who can't get a job and they're trying to get their first step into the working world. They are at this point where they will take anything because they need to pay the bills. And I hate how employers in corporate America see those workers as people that oh, that'll help our budget. You know, we can get Mm -hmm. away with paying them just a little less so it helps our bottom line. And I mean, I don't want to live in a world where we look at people that way. I don't ever want to run a business where I look at people that way as as some something that I can use to save money instead of people that I'm bringing on my team who will help me grow and succeed. And in turn, I can give them these benefits and a great life and make sure they're happy working for me. I don't understand where you know, we got lost down that road where people are not, people are just, you know, butts in a seat instead of people. I I wish we had a little bit more ethical capitalism in our society. You and me both. (laughs) You and Mm -hmm. me both. But it is, it is really tough when people, you're, when you're in the room and there are executives who say things like that, Mm -hmm. I always make a point to say like, we are not, these, these aren't, people aren't coupons. We're not doing it to like save money. We're going to benchmark the role for what the market will pay it, and we're going to do it equitably. So if it's yeah. one person in the role, two people in the role, I don't care what their background is. They're being paid exactly the same. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of executives feel this like pressure, especially in the last year, like the rise of all the layoffs. They feel all this yeah. pressure to like scale back their costs. And your biggest budget line item is your people. And so right. they think, okay, well, I should just pay people less. And yeah. we, then you and or I you could pay seen, your CEO less. Or, don't, don't get me started. Don't get me started on that because CEO pay is the highest it's ever been. And mm-hmm. shareholders are getting back millions in buybacks. But our employee salaries have not gone up the same way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so and they're making record profits, but mm-hmm. still laying off their people. That yes. can't. That really irks me. Yeah, I think it bothers a lot of people. And I think like I don't know. I wish I could fix that because it makes me so angry every day. And I just don't know how to fix it because we live in a society where you have to make money. Yeah. Maybe there's a street interview series I can start (laughs) to combat that. How do we fix it? (laughs) 
I would love that. Call yeah. me up. Well, I'm in DC, so you just tell me what street you're on, and yeah, I'll pretend to be on the street. Yeah, we were in the same neighborhood. That's I'm wild. Never in Georgetown, though, so mm. usually if I'm in Georgetown, I'm so angry that I'm there because it's usually very busy. <laughs> the parking the people, <laughs> the people, I feel that. <laughs> I have to go return something, and I'm like, I can't do this. There are fifty thousand people I on the street. I specifically avoid Georgetown for returns. Same. If I'm Same. going to Georgetown, I'm on a mission for food or something, but. Oh, my God. I avoid Georgetown like the plague unless it's important. <laughs> I feel that. But I will find you on any street and you can interview me about what to do because I don't know what to do. <laughs> but we, we've we been trying. I've been writing about it a lot um, through the newsletter and talking to HR people about it. And I feel like we are, we play this like very interesting position where I know a ton of HR people when we're doing interviews and we'll ask somebody, what ta- what compensation are you targeting if we don't already have the band in front of us and tell them that ahead of time? And they tell us sometimes a candidate will lowball themselves, and I'll say, "Hey, actually, I think you should be asking for this." Yeah, so like my job too. In interviews, I love that. And I know a lot of HR people that do this. They'll be like, "Oh, what I heard was twenty thousand dollars more," because that's mm-hmm. what your market rate actually is. And that's like mm-hmm. what I've been doing to help candidates, where I want them to understand, like, "Hey, you're undervaluing yourself." Yeah, but there are bad HR teams out there that will say, "Oh my God, great! Now I get a deal on this person." Right. There's. The good actors and the bad actors. And I'm so happy to hear, though, that at least there are some HR managers out there who are, for sure, you know, they see it for what it is and they're able to, you know, hey, she, they asked for a little bit less than what we're willing to offer, you know, just add a little 20K there. (laughs) That's that's being an ally. That's that's what I feel like, especially it's funny because all the people that I know do it are all women and women of color. So it's of course they are. <laughs> of even, course they are. <laughs> it's even more fascinating because like every single person is like, wait, you do that. I do that, too, has been a woman of color. Yeah. And we've been like, it's important because well, we've seen the studies like we know women mm-hmm. make less than men. I think the pig app Lulu was saying is like three cents now. Like it's, it's the smallest it's ever been. But I think that that's like the general pay gap. Yeah. Like if you're still looking at you know, breaking jobs out directly by role, directly by industry. And then if you break it out even further by by race, by, you know, yep. disability, by identity, it's still so prolific. Yeah. Like the the equal pay days that happen like so far into the year. Yeah. November. Like, oh. I'm like, you're kidding me. Like, wait, mm-hmm. this is, how is no one mad about this? I think I yeah. said it. I said it on LinkedIn once because I was like, uh, by the time we close the pay gap, I will be dead. I'll be long yeah. gone from this earth. And that mm-hmm. frustrates me because I'm like, I want to see it happen now. Mm-hmm. So I think what you're doing is helping a lot of that too. And I think like, there are a lot of HR people who are also trying to help it. And I see this massive movement mm-hmm. and I just hope that it can be sooner rather than later. I agree. Yeah. Like I think that the pay gap has only closed like 10 cents or something in the past like 20 years it's so like it's just like little baby tiny steps in the right direction but yeah. i mean i am encouraged by pay transparency legislation kind mm-hmm. of helping close that those gaps and putting more pressure on corporate america to be a good actor in, in this space but yeah it is really discouraging especially gosh the second i put anything in my content about equal pay the comments really the comments are i i've told my husband like i literally the only men that i like in this world are my husband and my dad <laughs> the, and the internet the and the internet I've is a, the, same. <laughs> the internet is the entire reason behind that because i just the comments that i see from from men and and it is men like and it, that's not just me you know being like a feminist but like it is men who are always the ones saying the pay gap doesn't exist. Women are complaining, oh, like this woman made more than this guy in this video. So the pay gap isn't real. And it's it's so exhausting to have to constantly defend this issue and, you know, stand up for people. And, you know, I, I get it. Like women are as empowered now as they've ever been. But the reality is more women work in housekeeping more women work in nursing, more women work in education, which are all traditionally maternal roles, you know, ones that women are expected to do. The second that I see a 50-50 split between nurses and preschool teachers with men and women, we can talk about the pay gap closing. But when I see 80% of daycare teachers are women, 80% of nurses are women, 
there is a pay gap because it shouldn't be that split. It shouldn't be 90% of engineers are men, 90% of mechanics are men. Once we've got 50-50 splits in all roles, we can talk about the pay gap closing. But until that happens, it's not realistic to say that it doesn't exist. Yeah. My, so my sister is um, an engineer. She has a PhD mm-hmm. in electrical engineering. I love that. Like, she's a genius. And mm-hmm. I, I have the misfortune of coming after her in my family. So I'm like, <laughs> damn it, I came after the smartest person. Why? <laughs> but she always said, I mean, she would tell me stories about how she would be the only woman in a room so many times. Mm-hmm. And she was like very encouraging of women in STEM. But mm-hmm. still, I have not seen that percentage change. It feels like there's all this societal pressure like 10 years ago, they're like, women in STEM, we're going to get more girls in STEM. And now mm-hmm. I feel like I don't see it as much. I don't know if that's no. just me because I'm not consuming children content. I don't know. Like, you know, I don't yes. see things where they're encouraging people to do it. But it's interesting that you say that because there is such a there is such a gap there where there's such a such small a percentage gap. of women in some roles and even CEO positions. Oh, yeah. Executive level. Exa- yep. Oh, my gosh. And and it's not just women. It's it's diversity as well. Yep. Like the push of black women in particular out of executive roles in the past year makes my blood boil. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's just we're, we're walking backwards. Also, I don't know if we're on track because <laughs> yeah. I could talk about this oh, all day. It's OK. But like, I'm going to talk about whatever I want on this podcast. It's amazing. <laughs> but like, yeah, it just it makes my blood boil because I. It just I don't understand why, even though data has shown that more diversity within organizations makes them more profitable yep. based on data, we're still seeing this push of diversity out of corporate America, which is completely backwards from what we've been striving to achieve is more diversity. The only thing that kind of makes me sleep better at night is knowing that despite bad actors you know, pushing their own agenda there, Society is not moving in their direction. Our society is being becoming so diverse, even more yeah. diverse than last year. You know, every year it becomes more diverse. And so the the actual trend of people is not going to be diverse in the future. And so you can't fight it at a certain point. Like yeah. we're eventually going to see that that mix that we need in our in our corporate society. But right now, Gosh, it's like waiting for the boomers to retire. <laughs> Our poor parents. They, <laughs> oh my gosh, my poor father. <laughs> I think it's so interesting you say that because I was just talking to someone about Gen Z in the workplace, mm-hmm. and I, everyone's like, oh Gen Z. Okay, and, and I'm not gonna lie. At first, I was like, oh god, this new generation. They like, <laughs> they want boundaries. They want work life balance. That's wild. And then I was yeah. like, wait a minute. They actually wait. want all the things I want but I have been forced to believe I don't get to have Mm -hmm. because I have to care so much about working hard and hustle culture. Mm -hmm. And so even more having more Gen Z in the workplace, I think like a lot of Gen, every single Gen Z person I think I've possibly ever met has been pro pay transparency. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is amazing. We need more people that are pro all the things that make work better in the Mm -hmm. workplace. Have you, yeah. Have you interviewed a lot of Gen Z people who have talked about how that part of their generation and like their generation's identity is that they want more transparency? You know, I haven't talked to any Gen Z that has said that specifically, but I think that the point of that is that it doesn't need to be said. Mm -hmm. Gen Z doesn't need, doesn't feel like they need to even validate why pay transparency is important. It's just point blank period important. It makes sense. They are not going to apply to a job where they don't know what the pay is. I know. Why would you go look at a car that you want to buy without knowing what the price is? Why would you waste your time? And time right now is so important. We are all moving a million miles a minute. None of us have enough PTO to constantly be going out on these job interviews, you know, and wasting our time without knowing that it's worth it in this economy. Yeah. <laughs> No, none of us have that time. And I think that Gen Z is really kind of the victim of all of these bad policies, you Mm -hmm. know, coming into one. They are graduating with so much debt, making less than their parents, can't buy a house, will never be able to buy a house in their lifetime, will probably tap out at like 100K in their earning potential over a 50 year period the way that it's moving now, which is not even enough to live or pay rent. So to them, they're like, why do I have to validate <laughs> that this this system that helps people earn more and helps you earn more 
is important. They don't even feel the need to have to explain that. It's yeah. just expected. When I talk to millennials, that's when I ta- when I hear people say, my colleague found out that they were making less, you know, after seeing, you know, all the stories, all the stories, you name it, I've heard it. And it's always millennials who are like, this system sucks. We need to change it. And it's Gen X and boomers that I usually have to explain why transparency matters. They're the ones that are like, and what are you doing this for? What is this school project? And I'm like, no, it's not a it's not a what school, is project. school project. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how many times people have told me that they thought I was a college student and they were like, oh, I thought I was just doing you a favor. <laughs> I'm like, Hey, I got the interview. Like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. it. You're I'm like, I'm the CEO of this very <laughs> successful company. Yeah. <laughs> but like Gen Z is so cool. Like they, I, I feel bad for them. I'm I'm kind of Gen Z. I call myself a geriatric Gen Z because I'm I'm 27. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm a 96 baby. I'm like, I, I thought I was millennial my whole life. And then they were like, no, you're Gen Z. So I'm right in the middle. Um, But it's cool because I feel like I, gained both experiences. You know, I saw the millennial side and I'm also part of this Gen Z side. And I love leaning into Gen Z because honestly, they make me confident. They make me really, they make me feel empowered because the way that they just stand up for themselves and they don't feel the need to justify it. They just know that they deserve better and they stand by that, I think is so remarkable. And something like you mentioned, millennials especially have been told, you know, no, you don't deserve that stop whining, stop being a baby, suck it up. Like that's that's what they've heard their whole lives. And so yep. I just think that Gen Z is like, we're passing the torch to a really powerful generation. I'm so excited to see what they do next. Yeah, there's going to be, I'm just excited for them to be like the majority or <laughs> a bigger majority in the workplace because yeah. I, I think I want all the things they want. And so to mm-hmm. me, I'm just like, great, now I can actually deliver the things that these people want. And if yeah. I can't deliver it, I'll tell them why and they'll still respect me because that's all they want to know. They also mm-hmm. want to know why I can't do the thing that they're asking for. Yeah. So I feel pretty excited about it. Um, yeah. Any salaries that you've interviewed people on the street that you've just been shocked, like either really low or really high? Shocked in a bad yeah. way more often than shocked in a good way. Really? Sadly, I mean, anytime somebody tells me they're a teacher, I hold my breath. I'm like, oh, gosh, this is not going to be good. Um, those always like break my heart, especially older teachers. Like it, sometimes I talk to because the majority of people that say yes to the interview are usually younger generations because they're mm-hmm. the ones that really believe in transparency. But whenever I get to talk to someone older who's a teacher, I'm always like, oh, gosh, I really hope that after decades in this field, you were making enough, you know, to survive. And I think I interviewed a music teacher in Philly who had retired and he was making like 70k on his way out and i just you know it's hard to be neutral in your reaction cuz you don't want people to feel bad about their salaries cuz nobody should i mean we should all feel proud of however much we make but yeah. it just hurts my heart that the most important people in our society i'm seeing are traditionally the lowest paid the ones that drive our buses, that take us to work, the ones that run our metro system, the ones that educate our children, the ones that take care of our families, like healthcare workers. Because it's not, when I interview people in healthcare, the people that are making the most are the doctors and (laughs) the healthcare workers that have been in for decades or have very specific skill sets that they needed to go to years of expensive school to get. Or, you know, have to be exceptionally intelligent to be able to do. And that's not possible for everybody else. So then you interview people that are more entry level in in healthcare, but are still important. You know, EMTs, first responders, like these are the people that show up when you're having an emergency that you want them to be well compensated because you want them to be happy in their roles so they take good care of you. Those people are barely making minimum wage. Like when I interview EMTs and they tell me they make 20 bucks an hour, 19 bucks an hour, I want to scream because how is that in any way going to have positive repercussions on the rest of us if we're not showing that the most valuable people in our society deserve to be somewhat the most well compensated? I don't care about the data scientist at Amazon 
making $500,000. When I hear that, I, I'm almost a little disgusted, honestly. I want to hear the nurse making 150 k and being able to not only have good work-life balance so that she can show up at her job, but that she can also have a life outside of it. How yeah. are we? Because the the whole essence of this is when I do these interviews and I show, you know, an, a, a healthcare worker who's not making enough and the comments kind of justify that. They're like, whoa, that's not enough. It makes me sad because I think about the students in college or in, in high school right now who are thinking about what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And they are immediately saying, I'm not going to be a teacher. I'm not going to work in healthcare because I'm not going to make enough money to survive. It's not even a matter of I'm not going to be rich. It's that they're not going to make enough money to survive. Yeah. What? How does that look good for our society 10, 20 years from now? It doesn't like that. It doesn't. That's like a and real that conversation. Makes me sad. I think it's a real conversation a lot of people don't want to have. But I felt yeah. like growing up too. So my parents immigrated to the states. My dad mm -hmm. was a professor, so like mm -hmm. teaching was like always big enough. But he was a professor, which I think professors get paid better than school teachers sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I I think there was like a big focus on education in my family, but also there came a point where my parents would ask us like, "What do you want to do when you grow up?" And at one point, my earliest career was I told them I wanted to be a writer. And my mm -hmm. parents were like, hey, like, yeah, don't do that. We, we immigrated to this like country so you could have a better life. And like, we don't think you'd want to do that. And I remember my mom, and I don't know if she would ever remember the, having this conversation with me. But at one point, she said to me, like, do you want your career to be your passion? Or do you want to have a career and be able to live a life and pay for things and then do your passion on the side? And so I feel like we're at this inflection point to a society where people are making decisions like, I have to go get this high paying job and I have to put aside the thing I am passionate about because that I can't live anymore off of that. Yeah. And I think of like writers, television writers, like yeah. comic is anybody in the arts, anyone in the <laughs> arts is just like they can't live. And mm -hmm. I think that was like part of the union for the writer strike was like, yeah, they need to get paid so they can have health insurance like you can't. It's, yeah, it's such a low paying field. So I feel like that's a big conversation to be had. And I've, I've always been upset that teachers don't get paid as much because some of my most formidable moments as a human being like happened in the home and happened in the school where yeah. teachers were like, I believe in you or mm -hmm. like, I know you can do this or let me coach and mentor you. Let me write your recommendation. And so mm -hmm. to me, I've always felt like teachers should have been paid, should be paid so much more. Yeah, I agree. I just think that we're not you know, the way that Amazon and these big tech corporations are valuing their talent for tech work, you know, software engineers, data analysts, data scientists, yada, yada. We need to have the same view of our educators and our healthcare workers in society that we need to be paying competitive rates and offering really great benefits so that they want to do these jobs. The same way that Amazon is like, we need to have the most competitive package for these people because we need the best of the best. Why do we not have the same value in our society for the people that are growing our society, that are building it, that are sustaining it? We need to have those same values. Yeah. Do you remember during the Great Resignation where like a lot of teachers yeah. were leaving school and going to work the in The Great corporate? Resignation actually really inspired me to start Salary Transparent Street because I, I lived through it. Like I yeah. when I graduated, <laughs> I graduated in 2019. So I was working like a year before the pandemic hit. And that was such a, oh my God, it threw my world upside down. But it was really inspiring to, to witness people being like, F this, <laughs> you know, I'm leaving. I'm going somewhere else. And the sad part of that though was the teachers that left. And I've interviewed a couple teachers who have, been, you know, transitioned out of yeah. education and now do something else. Like I interviewed some lady that worked at Indeed um, and she Ooh. left teaching to be an instructional designer there. Mm -hmm. So she really like transitioned her skills. And I thought that that was really cool, but it was still sad to be like, wow, this lady's making more at Costco than she did teaching. You know, like th these stories are just insane. And I, I don't know why our representatives and our government is not listening to us like screaming this from the rooftops that we're going to have a whole crisis in like five or 10 years if we don't change it. Yeah. 
I mean, I will hopefully be alive then because I have a lot of, right? <laughs> like, I have a lot of feelings. We're going to be like, we crisis. told you so. We told you so. <laughs> My favorite thing to say at work, actually, I told you so. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's very true. And I, I don't know why people are, aren't listening to it more. And I think a lot of HR people, I personally feel the pressure to like really understand what's happening in the world of pay transparency and making sure market rates, I understand like, I joke sometimes. Or I'm like, BRB, I need to Google the economy just to see what's going on today. <laughs> but like, we also have to understand that because there are things outside of our control that yeah. like are having very real impacts on our employees. And they like show the studies that, like when you're a pay transparent organization, like your employees are actually more motivated because sure. they know like, okay, I'm being paid for this and now I want to be paid for this. And to get there, yeah. like, I'm going to work hard. And I know that that's a level I can reach. Isn't that crazy how that works, that if you pay <laughs> your people well and they feel valued, they're more productive, they're more loyal, there's better employee morale, less turnover, like everything yeah. meshes in the company. But for some reason, corporate America is just not understanding that. I think the hard part where I get a little stuck sometimes, too, is I will tell an employee, like, here's how I came up with your salary. And they'll still say, well, I think you're underpaying me. Mm -hmm. And it happens so often. Like, I have this joke that, like, everyone thinks they're underpaid. Most yeah. people probably are, but mm -hmm. some people are paid fairly. Yeah. So that, that one to me is like the hardest to deal with. Absolutely. And that's something that we kind of have an issue with is like you hear, you know, well, I'll interview someone who will not share that they work at Apple, you know, or, or like yeah. a thing, like a really big tech company. And because, you know, we usually keep the company private because companies, as we know, like to retaliate against their employees. And so, oh. you know, we know that that person works at a big tech company, but then the comments see somebody making 300K and they're like, that's insane. You know, like my uh, the, all the people I know don't make that, you know, and I do worry sometimes that it has that repercussion of people going into job interviews and now feeling like, oh, I saw that on Salary Transparent Street. So that's what I can ask for. But in turn, I try to over educate our audience on market rates and how to find it. And yeah. that you should not just use one source, you should use at least five because the data is different everywhere. And also understanding, you know, so many contextual factor factors that affect your pay, like industry, company size, company industry, like location, years of experience, education, all of those things come together to affect your market rate. And so someone making 300K might have those things that you don't, that will not apply at maybe a smaller company or a different industry. And so it's just important to be educated, I think, on market rate and not just see, you know, face values on salary transparency. It doesn't mean they're not real salaries. It just yeah. means that you need to do your own, you need to do your own research. Yeah. Do you ever ask people, I think you do, the just their base versus like equity? Yeah. Because I think equity is... Equity is a big one. If you get like options at a publicly traded company, like your compensation mm -hmm. could be wildly different, which yeah. has also just been interesting when all the stocks were like tanking. I was like, mm -hmm. is anyone at those companies thinking to themselves, wait, now my compensation is changing? Yeah, I hope that they are because like that's sometimes it's like half of their total compensation. Yeah. And so whenever equity. whenever I hear someone say like a big number, I'm like, can you break that out for me with base salary and RSUs and bonus? And, <laughs> yeah. and usually it comes back down. But yeah, it's it's important. And I in a way, I feel like that kind of complicates things because then people see like, oh, God, like now I have to negotiate stocks and I got to negotiate my bonus. Like, yeah. there's so many things you have to negotiate. But the sooner we normalize it, the easier it'll be for everyone. And I think pay transparency just helps make those situations a lot less stressful because you know what the rate is for at least the base salary. So you get a little bit of information to go off of. If you're like it, completely in the dark, I can understand yeah. why people don't want to negotiate or don't want to you yeah. know, even try because it's so scary. What do you even ask for? It's terrible. Yeah. When I'm doing interviews, because I do our phone screens sometimes, I'll say like I'll, if I don't have a band set, which I hate going to an interview without a band, but like sometimes I'm like, we really don't know what we want for this role. So, I'll, and I'll be upfront with the candidate about it too. I'll say like, can you tell me what you think you would make for this role? And then I'll also say like, I just want to be clear. I'm not going to hold you to this. Like, I just okay. want to know. And I always like, I try to make it more comfortable for them. So I'm like, hey, compensation is like an uncomfortable conversation for a lot of people. I'm going to okay. take that all away. Tell me the number that you're thinking right now. If that number changes on this path as we like interview and talk more, we can revisit it. Like whatever you say right now is not set in stone. Just tell me what you're thinking and we can work through it. 
but that's mm-hmm. only if I don't have a band set. My like rule is like we have to have a band set for every single role and we have to share it in the first conversation because mm-hmm. we're not going to waste people's yeah. time by going through five interviews and getting to the end and realizing our compensation asks are wildly off. Mm-hmm. Man, so, we need to clone you <laughs> and put you in all of these, <laughs> every <there's> a, office. <laughs> there's a lot of HR people also trying to do this. I think for me personally, like I have been the person who knows they're paid less than their counterpart, who has found out that they make, that they're doing like 10x the work. My sister has mm-hmm. this like long running joke where she's always like, whenever you start a job, you need to start stop trying so hard. You always mm-hmm. try so hard. You always get so many responsibilities and then you feel like you're underpaid. Like, stop trying so hard is like my sister's True. way of dealing that's with that's a good piece of advice. I like that. <laughs> She's like, give your 50%. Your 50% mm-hmm. is probably someone's 100%. And I'm like, that's it's such true. bad advice though. But no, but it's true though. And like, if, you, if you're constantly trying to like overperform, then you are setting that expectation with your management yeah. that that is your normal. And if you yeah. veer off of it, like I'm I'm a super perfectionist, like type A to a T. And so. <laughs> I, I'm the same way. Like I would just go 120% the first day on the job. And you get so quickly burnt out because you can't sustain that level of like energy for years on years. And then you do have that where you're like, mm, I'm working harder than everybody else. Am I fairly compensated? And it's like, I mean, yeah. you were at 25% of your effort. <laughs> and now you're doing so much more than your job description too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I always talk about too, there's like this weird time where companies kind of take advantage of people. Like once you're mm-hmm. in and you have a salary, right? And let's say you show up and you start doing like 110%. They're like, wow, mm-hmm. this person's great. Let's give them more work. Yeah. But then the more work doesn't always come with a pay raise or a title change. Rarely. It's gray area that I'm like very picky about where I'm like, if we are asking people to go above and beyond their job description, we Mm -hmm. need to revisit their job description, which also means revisiting their level, which also means revisiting their compensation. Like I wish more companies weren't afraid of being more fluid with their promotions versus Mm -hmm. being like, we only promote people twice a year. And that like, was my like, company. They're like, you have to be here a year and we don't yeah. give out rates of more than three to 5%. And I'm like, I'm a top performer. I'm telling you, I'm going to leave if you don't pay me what I'm yeah. worth. <laughs> yeah. And I did. And you know what they told me when I left the day that I put in my two weeks? They Tell asked me to name my price to stay. And I told them I already did. And then I left. <laughs> yeah. They also show studies that like if you get another offer and you throw it on the table and then your, mm-hmm. co- your current company matches, you will leave within a year anyway. You will. That happened to me because I asked leave for a raise year. at one of my companies because I, I kept getting so many offers to join other companies and they kept giving me higher rates, higher rates. And I liked where I was at. So I was like, let me just ask the company, you know, if I can get a raise to yeah. match it so that I don't leave for more money. They gave me the raise and then I still left three months later because I could get more money elsewhere. So see, 100%. That's true. It's it's like the I, I always like to educate people on this when we're having conversations too about talent because I'm like, if you really want to keep top talent, just pay them, pay them what they want. And if they're asking for something that is outrageous, ask them why they're asking for that and help you understand what it mm-hmm. is they really want. Yeah. Like if. They're paid fairly. Like maybe they want something different. Maybe they want more vacation days. Maybe they want to go yeah. and do a professional course. Like it can't, it doesn't always have to be about like actual mm-hmm. base compensation. Sometimes people mm-hmm. want something else. They just like don't know how to ask about it. So that's so true. I, I tell people about that too, though, because sometimes, you know, I get, I get messages from people saying, I've negotiated, I've negotiated. And they tell me that they can't, you know, they don't have the money for the base salary that I'm asking. And I'm like, you can negotiate other things like total compensation matters too. You can ask yeah. for pet insurance, childcare, PTO days, 401k match. Like everything is negotiable. If they can't budge on base salary, there's other things that are also worth a monetary value that can make your life easier, give you more flexibility. And essentially having that flexibility and support can make up for base salary sometimes. Yeah, that's so true. I'm like, ask for more vacation. <laughs> Somebody asked me recently, like an old colleague, like, what else can I ask for? I was like, more mm-hmm. vacation. That's like, yeah. If, you, if it's a possible, higher match the- on your 401k, like there's so, so many, many things. things. So a many sign things. on bonus, like everything. Tons. I think at this point in my life, it's funny because I get a lot of shit from my friends about this, but I'm like, everything's negotiable. Mm-hmm. They're like, that's not it how is. it works. I'm like, no, it is. 
<laughs> it is. That's, that is how it works for me. And they're like, that's not real. Everything. And I'm like, it is. You just have to approach it with that mindset because the only person who wins when you think that you can't negotiate things is the corporations and the people Yeah, the person you're paying. And I'm like, I don't want anyone to be taken advantage of. That's like my worst case scenario is an employee mm-hmm. comes to me and says like, I'm being taken advantage of. I'm going above and beyond. And now you're not paying me more. And so I just think by negotiating, you like have some, we all have power and say in our circumstances. And like the biggest joke or trick any corporate America has played on us is making us think we're powerless. Yeah. Oh my God. Here, (laughs) here. We are so not powerless. powerless. they're, They're not. Like if an employee comes to me with like a very real ask, like every employee can ask anything they want. And I will, I will either have to answer or tell them like why I can't deliver that thing. And so I yeah. think more, but I think a lot of employees are afraid of retaliation, like you and I said, like that's why they don't want their company name on the videos that they do with yeah. you. And re- and that's the problem, right? It's that power imbalance is that people are still scared of their employers. And that's crazy. Like they are scared of their employers that if they go out and tell a stranger how much they make at their role, that mm-hmm. they will be fired from their company saying that out loud sounds insane can i tell you a secret yeah i'm a secret okay so i also think employers are afraid of their employees because of everything that's happening on tiktok where people are recording themselves being fired like that video with britney peach that went viral i love that she's such an icon for that I was like watching it. I was like, oh, man, here's what I would have done as the HR team. Like I I had a lot of advice for the HR team and I don't think they handled it well, to be very clear. But I also think like layoffs are, if you execute one well, congratulations, you're one of the few. Because I Mm -hmm. don't think, I I think a lot of- They rarely go well. They rarely Mm -hmm. go well because you don't think about these things and you don't, you're not preparing the people to deliver the message correctly. But Mm -hmm. I was after that, like in my HR circles, everyone was like, oh my God, did you see this? Oh my God, did you Mm -hmm. see this? Could you imagine if you were being recorded? And I was like, I literally live my life. My internal comms have one rule. Imagine this gets leaked. How will I feel? That's how so many people should be operating because a lot of people don't. (laughs) I'm like, you got to you gotta be able to stand Solves by a lot the thing of that you did. I'm like, if I, because I, I mean, I've also worked at a media organization. I worked at Axios. And so like, mm-hmm. that was a common thing where like journalists would go tell other journalists things and break news. And so I yeah. thought it was, I always lived my life there too. It was like, imagine all my internal comms got leaked. And mm-hmm. once I be, started behaving that way, where I like actually really spent time thinking about who, what am I saying and how does it represent me and the company? I feel mm-hmm. like it was like freedom for me. Yeah, so I was like, I'm going to put it out there and I'm going to do mm-hmm. my best. But now yeah. I think a lot of employers have like massive fear of being reported by their employees. Mm-hmm. They have things to fear, though. Like, mm-hmm. I don't I think the the idea of like being fearful of something happening doesn't exist without knowing that there is something there that if it were exposed could ruin them. There's yep. you don't have fear without something to be feared being there. You know, yeah. like they they don't want people talking about pay in the office. That's the number one thing. You know, they're like, it's going to cause drama. It's going to cause issues. No, it's because they are paying people less than what they're worth. And mm-hmm. if that gets out, those people are going to trash them on the Internet as they should. And they're going to leave as they should. Yeah. Like they're not scared of nothing. They're scared because they're not doing the right things and they're worried it's going to be exposed. That I love the age of the internet that we're in where we are holding these companies accountable. And I like that our platform kind of lends itself to that as well. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I loved it. I, when, I was, when I started watching your videos, one, I think it's because you are in DC. So it probably was like, here's some DC content for you. But then <laughs> yeah. the algorithm quickly found out that I am an HR person. So now I get a lot of like HR. They were like, just, she's getting everything money she's related. She's going to get all these things about <laughs> money and work. But then I started watching them and I was like, this is so fucking good. Like I mm-hmm. just have to, I have to seriously commend you. Like when I, the first Thank video you. I saw, I was like, fuck yes. Like someone on the street asking people how much money they make. <laughs> that shit is so powerful. And Thank I think the, this age of the internet, you're right, is like people recording, people getting fired, like all these things. I'm like, do it more because I already feel super accountable as an HR person. But if this is going to push me to become even more accountable, then I yeah. welcome it. 
because I don't mm-hmm. want to be one person in private and be another person in public. I want the yeah. company to actually stand for the things I believe in because I think I think the future is going to be built by the people who want to do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the future is going to be built by Gen Z and they believe in transparency. So <laughs> that corporate America do. better get on board now rather than later. I love that. Okay, before we wrap up the episode, any <laughs> wild stories while you're like out in the wild filming? Anything wild that's ever happened? Have you ever run into like a celebrity? Have you ever? Yeah, I've I I've interviewed that. a couple poster. celebrities. I feel very lucky. Um, oh my god! I we got invited actually to. So I got a random email from ABC Productions that was Shark Tank, and it, it was like Shark Tank. And I opened it and I I get like a ton of like spam emails like every single day. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, this is fake. Like it's an invitation. It's very vague. Like it literally was like, come to our event on this day at this time. And that was like it. it, Like it had no formal sign off. It looked like it was auto generated. But I looked at the email, you know, and I. I'm like very much like I'm a sleuth. I'm like, what is this? Is this real? Because if it's real, like this is a big deal. And I look at the email and it's it's an ABC like Disney domain. And I'm like, this is legit. Like this is an actual email. <laughs> so I respond and I'm like, okay, I guess we'll go. But I'm in DC, right? And the event was in New York City. And it was like, we were not going to be in New York City for any other reason. So I look at my husband and I'm like, I have no idea what this event is about. Like, we have no information. We don't know if the sharks are going to be there. We don't know who's going to be there. We don't know what it is, but we got invited and we could maybe go. And so we decided like that day, really last minute, we were like, we're going to go because like if it is something, it could be huge, right? I'm so glad we did because we went and not only were they giving away so much product like every single item that's been on shark tank that's like a bestseller they had tables of it and they gave me a big bag and they were like here you go only take one thing and everyone was taking a ton so at the end of the day we were like grab everything lol (laughs) only take one thing no no literally (laughs) yeah we came home with like three scrub daddies it was amazing um but not only that the sharks were there I walked behind Shut. Barbara Corcoran <laughs> up the stairs and I'm just like, be cool, be cool, be cool. <laughs> she was there. Um, Lori wasn't there, but Mr. F- Mr. Fantastic was there. Mr. Mark Wonderful. Cuban was there. You were close so I got Mr. an interview. Like I literally interviewed Mark Cuban. I interviewed Barbara Stop. Corcoran. Ah. That was crazy. Um, for some reason, Mark Cuban like knew that my husband and I had just got married. So like after he was like, congratulations on the marriage. And I'm like, I've never talked to you before. How do you know this? Like, Stop. it was just so cool. He's also really freaking tall. <laughs> you know, I he's my favorite know. shark, right? Fun fact. He is my favorite he, shark. He's always, he asks the best questions about the margins and the revenue. And I'm like, he's the smartest. And if I ever made anything, Mark Cuban, I'm calling you in a heartbeat. because He's he a legit so dude. Smart. Like. He really, I I like him too. And I met him and I was like, I'm even more of a fan now because you're just, you're legit. Like you're the real deal. Barbara Corcoran was really cool too. Like Barbara is so nice. Um, She's just as sweet and charming in person as she seems on camera and also really, really smart. Like she had really cool stories. Our interview was like 10 minutes long. (laughs) And I was only able to share 90. Isn't she like a major investor in one of the pay, pay softwares? I feel like she that I don't know, but if she is, HR I should software. find out. Because I'm trying to remember <laughs> that could be a partnership. Yeah, but yeah, like Shark Tank. Anyway. That was cool. So we got to interview Mark Cuban, Barbara Corcoran. Those are like my my top celebrities. Um, I always have like really cool like fangirl moments because I, you know, I'm a content like consumer. I love content. Same. I follow my people and I fangirl about them. And then, you know, we go to VidCon and people come up to us and they're like freaking out about us. And I'm like, you need to stop because I'm freaking out about you. You know, I and love it's, this. It's, it's cool. Like what I love about being a content creator is I feel like we all kind of feel the same way. So whenever I meet another content creator who like I'm freaking out about, they like have the same feeling that I do when someone like freaks out about us. And we're just For like sure. we're normal people. Like we yeah. just create content on the Internet. Like I think a lot of us don't think that we're famous but it's like people see us that way so it it can be a little bizarre but it's it's a really cool experience like 
I I met Chelsea Cutler. I don't know if you know her. She's a I yeah. love Chelsea Cutler. She's in DC in forties. I know. And I'm none go- of my. <gasps> Do you want to know this Hannah, story? None of my friends would go with me. All my friends she were like, got "No, us VIP <laughs> to go," because <laughs> I love her. I went to her Same. show in DC back in 2022. Same. Wait, did you go yeah. to 2019? Were you there 2019? No, uh, I wasn't that 2019. Uh-uh. Oh, I saw her 2019 930 club. I thought I was the oldest person there at the time, so it was fine. But she was she's so good. Her music she's is so, so good. good. I'm like her biggest fan. I have like her signed thing right over here. Like I I love her and I was a huge fan before we started Salary Transparent Street. And like I forget how it happened, but I followed her on her account because I was like, I love Chelsea Cutler. Like, you know, and I, it's my account. Like I own Salary Transparent Street. So I followed her (laughs) and I think I commented something on her video and she sent me a DM and she was like, I love your content. Like your channel is amazing. And I, I think I pooped my pants. Like (laughs) I was so, oh my, like, I I was like, you have no idea. Like I'm, I'm your biggest fan. Like this is the coolest thing. And we ended up like exchanging numbers. Now I text her. We met up with her in New York and did an interview with her. And now she's coming back to D.C. And I told her I got tickets because, of course, I did. Like, I was going to go as a normal person. And she's like, girl, no, I'll set you up with VIP. I'll see you after the show. My manager's going to come get you. So now I'm just like, I'm so excited about this. Like, it's the coolest. <laughs> yeah, I am geeking out because That's literally fair. I talk about Chelsea Cutler to everybody and I follow her on Twitter and I'll tweet it's at amazing. her like, all the time. Like, now that I know she's a good person. I just such a good person. Now like, that just fills me with so much way joy better than you can imagine. She is so cool. Is so beautiful. And I like it's a so friend will just send each other songs back and forth. I have my mm-hmm. own Chelsea Cutler playlist. Ugh. She's the best. Yeah, no, we're gonna be friends for life now because I now swear. that we're in DC. And I tried to ask, I asked five people to go with me to this concert, including my husband, and they all were like, No. No, you every have single- to get your husband to come. My husband every comes single- with me. He loves no. Chelsea Cutler now too. <laughs> I went by myself to a Heim concert because my husband was like, I'm not in the mood. And I was like, I have VIP you know what, tickets. I'm, I wait, I stood front row and mm-hmm. SD, my favorite Heim sister, threw me her drumstick. Which I have there to the States. There you go. Like, yeah. See, so, I, I don't think there's any shame in going by yourself. It's more fun. You don't have to worry about making sure somebody else is comfortable. Like if my husband wasn't coming with me, I'd go by myself. <laughs> yeah. I'm so jealous. You're going to have such a good time. I can't wait to hear how Jeez. it is. Also, yeah. now that we're in D.C., we can meet up and get coffee because. Absolutely. We have to. There's brunch like or something. Enough- DC, I also like, I'm like a little baby content creator, like not as mm-hmm. famous as you, but they, I still get people that come up to me at my own events that are like, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. And it is a very, it's just like such a heart work. Like it's, first of all, it fills me with so much joy because I'm like, it's I'm fine. creating content about HR. Like <laughs> somebody loves it. this. <laughs> somebody loves this. It's just like, I'm good with that. But yeah. it does fill you with so much joy. It also gives you like a real sense of responsibility. Yeah. And so that's why I just love what you're doing is going is helping so many people, one. Two, I think it's really helping the movement move towards true transparency where people are going to be paid equitably. Like, I want that gap to close and Mm -hmm. I see what you're doing is closing that gap. And like also pay transparency laws and HR people, but like together all of us have so much power to like move the momentum Mm -hmm. in the right direction. So yeah, the internet, the power of the internet. (laughs) I'm just excited we got time together today and you ended up being as cool in person as I thought you would be. I'm glad. No, this was fun. I'm I, I'm so glad you live in this area. We have to grab coffee or something. It'll be we'll so fun. Brunch. We have so many okay. things to talk about. <laughs> have, there's so much more this hour we'll not cover. Okay. So for much. those who want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to reach you? Obviously, follow you on TikTok, yeah. but what else? Uh, we are on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, every single platform you can imagine. I had to get them all because my dad was like, I am not getting TikTok. I'm not getting Instagram. <laughs> so I had to accommodate. Um, but we are at Salary Transparent Street on all pa- platforms. So make sure to follow us there. And we also have a newsletter. We have a free market research guide, free salary negotiation guide, and a salary database all available on our website, www.salarytransparentstreet.com. Heck yeah. And I'm going to link to all that in the show notes too. So Thank everyone you. will get a chance to see it. Also, I'm going to subscribe to this newsletter. I'm like, free market Thank data, you. say more. Yes, it's fun. We do it once a week. It comes out every Tuesday. It's like good information. We talk crap about corporate America and we hold Hell them accountable. Yeah. Always a good time. I love that. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Hannah. This was amazing. Thank you, Hubba. This was fun. <laughs> <laughs>